Lessons 9 and 10 of The Power of Concentration. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andrea Fiore, January 9, 2008. The Power of Concentration by Theron Q. Dumont. Lesson 9. Concentration can overcome bad habits. Habits make or break us to a far greater extent than we like to admit. Habit is both a powerful enemy and wonderful ally of concentration. You must learn to overcome habits which are injurious to concentration, and to cultivate those which increase it. The large majority of people are controlled by their habits, and are buffeted around by them like waves of the ocean tossing a piece of wood. They do things in a certain way because of the power of habit. They seldom ever think of concentrating on why they do them this way or that, or study to see if they could do them in a better way. Now my object in this chapter is to get you to concentrate on your habits, so you can find out which are good and which are bad for you. You will find that by making a few needed changes, you can make even those that are not good for you of service. The good habits you can make much better. The first thing I want you to realize is that all habits are governed consciously or unconsciously by the will. Most of us are forming new habits all the time. Very often, if you repeat something several times in the same way, you will have formed the habit of doing it that way. But the oftener you repeat it, the stronger that habit grows, and the more deeply it becomes embedded in your nature. After a habit has been in force for a long time, it becomes almost a part of you, and is therefore hard to overcome. But you can still break any habit by strong concentration on its opposite. All our life, so far as it has definite form, is but a mass of habits, practical, emotional, and intellectual systematically organized, for our weal or woe, and bearing us irresistibly toward our destiny, whatever the latter may be. We are creatures of habits, imitators and copiers of our past selves. We are liable to be bent or curved as we can bend a piece of paper, and each fold leaves a crease, which makes it easier to make the fold there the next time. The intellect and will are spiritual functions. Still they are immersed in matter, and to every moment of theirs corresponds a movement in the brain, that is, in their material correlative. This is why habits of thought and habits of willing can be formed. All physical impressions are the carrying out of the actions of the will and intellect. Our nervous systems are what they are today because of the way they have been exercised. As we grow older, most of us become more and more like automatic machines. The habits we have formed increase in strength. We work in our old characteristic way. Your associates learn to expect you to do things in a certain way. So you see that your habits make a great difference in your life, and as it is just about as easy to form good habits as it is bad, you should form only the former. No one but yourself is responsible for your habits. You are free to form the habits that you should, and if everyone could realize the importance of forming the right kind of habits, what a different world this would be. How much happier everyone would be. Then all instead of the few might win success. Habits are formed more quickly when we are young, but if we have already passed the youthful plastic period, the time to start to control our habits is right now, as we will never be any younger. You will find the following maxims worth remembering. First maxim, we must make our nervous system our ally instead of our enemy. Second maxim, in the acquisition of a new habit, as in the leaving off of an old one, we must take care to launch ourselves with as strong and decided an initiative as possible. The man that is in the habit of doing the right thing from boyhood has only good motives, so it is very important for you that you concentrate assiduously on the habits that reinforce good motives. Surround yourself with every age you can. Don't play with fire by forming bad habits. Make a new beginning today. Study why you have been doing certain things. If they are not for your good, shun them henceforth. 
Don't give in to a single temptation, for every time you do, you strengthen the chain of bad habits. Every time you keep a resolution, you break the chain that enslaves you. Third Maxim Never allow an exception to occur till the new habit is securely rooted in your life. Here is the idea. You never want to give in until the new habit is fixed, else you undo all that has been accomplished by previous efforts. There are two opposing inclinations. One wants to be firm, and the other wants to give in. By your will you can become firm, through repetition. Fortify your will to be able to cope with any and all opposition. Fourth Maxim Seize the very first possible opportunity to act on every resolution you make, and on every emotional prompting you may experience in the direction of the habits you aspire to gain. To make a resolve and not to keep it is of little value. So by all means keep every resolution you make, for you not only profit by the resolution, but it furnishes you with an exercise that causes the brain cells and physiological correlatives to form the habit of adjusting themselves to carry out resolutions. A tendency to act becomes efficiently ingrained in us in proportion to the uninterrupted frequency with which the actions actually occur, and the brain grows to their use. When a resolve or a fine glow of feeling is allowed to evaporate without bearing fruit, it is worse than a chance lost. If you keep your resolutions, you form a most valuable habit. If you break them, you form a most dangerous one. So concentrate on keeping them, whether important or unimportant, and remember it is just as important for this purpose to keep the unimportant, for by so doing, you are forming a habit. Fifth Maxim Keep the faculty of effort alive in you by a little gratuitous exercise every day. The more we exercise the will, the better we can control our habits. Every few days do something for no other reason than its difficulty, so that when the hour of dire need draws nigh, it may find you not unnerved or untrained to stand the test. Asceticism of this sort is like the insurance which a man pays on his house and goods. The tax does him no good at the time, and possibly may never bring him a return, but if the fire does come, his having paid it will be his salvation from ruin. So with the man who has daily insured himself to habits of concentrated attention, energetic volation, and self-denial in unnecessary things. He will stand like a tower when everything rocks around him, and his softer fellow mortals are winnowed like chaff in the blast. The young should be made to concentrate on their habits, and be made to realize that if they don't, they become walking bundles of injurious habits. Youth is the plastic state, and should be utilized in laying the foundation for a glorious future. The great value of habit for good and evil cannot be overestimated. Habit is the deepest law of human nature. No man is stronger than his habits, because his habits either build up his strength or decrease it. Why we are creatures of habits. Habits have often been called a labor-saying invention, because when they are formed they require less of both mental and material strength. The more deeply the habit becomes ingrained, the more automatic it becomes. Therefore, habit is an economizing tendency of our nature, for if it were not for habit, we should have to be more watchful. We walk across a crowded street, the habit of stopping and looking prevents us from being hurt. The right kind of habits keep us from making mistakes and mishaps. It is a well-known fact that the chauffeur is not able to master his machine safely until he has trained his body in a habitual way. When an emergency comes, he instantly knows what to do. Where safety depends on quickness, the operator must work automatically. Habits mean less risk, less fatigue and greater accuracy. You do not want to become a slave to habits of a trivial nature. For instance, Wagner required a certain costume before he could compose corresponding parts of his operas. Schiller could never write with ease unless there were rotten apples in the drawer of his desk, from which he could now and then obtain an odor which seemed to him sweet. Gladstone had different desks for his different activities, so that when he worked on Homer, he never sat among habitual accompaniments of his legislative labors. In order to overcome undesirable habits, two things are necessary. 
you must have trained your will to do what you want it to do and the stronger the will the easier it will be to break a habit then you must make a resolution to do just the opposite of what the habit is therefore one habit must replace another if you have a strong will you can tenaciously and persistently concentrate on removing the bad habit and in a very short time the good habit will gain the upper hand i will bring this chapter to a close by giving dr oppenheim's instructions for overcoming a habit if you want to abolish a habit and its accumulated circumstances as well you must grapple with the matter as earnestly as you would with a physical enemy you must go into the encounter with all tenacity of determination with all fierceness of resolve yea even with a passion for success that may be called vindictive no human enemy can be insidious so persevering as unrelenting as an unfavorable habit it never sleeps it needs no rest it is like a parasite that grows with the growth of the supporting body and like a parasite it can best be killed by violent separation and crushing when life is stormy and all seems against us that is when we often acquire wrong habits and it is then that we have to make a gigantic effort to think and speak as we should and even though we may feel the very reverse at that moment the tiniest effort will be backed up by a tremendous power and will lift us to a realization never felt before it is not in the easy contented moments of our life that we make our greatest progress for then it requires no special effort to keep in tune but it is when we are in the midst of trials and misfortunes when we think we are sinking being overwhelmed then it is important for us to realize that we are linked to a great power and if we live as we should there is nothing that can occur in life which could permanently injure us nothing can happen that should disturb us so always remember you have within you unlimited power ready to manifest itself in the form which fills our need at the moment if when we have something difficult to solve we would be silent like the child we can get the inspiration when it comes we will know how to act we will find there is no need to hurry or disturb ourselves that it is always wiser to wait for guidance from within than to act on impulse from without lesson 10 business results through concentration a successful business is not usually the result of chance neither is a failure the result of luck most failures could be determined in advance if the founders had been studied it is not always possible to start a money-making business at the start usually a number of changes have to be made plans do not work out as their creators thought they would they may have to be changed a little broadened it may be here and there and as you broaden your business you broaden your power to achieve you gain an intense and sustained desire to make your business a success when you start a business you may have but a vague notion of the way you will conduct it you must fill in the details as you go along you must concentrate on these details as you straighten out one after another others will require attention in this way you cover the field of the first endeavor and new opportunities open up for you when you realize one desire another comes but if you do not fulfill the first desire you will not the second the person that does not carry his desires into action is only a dreamer desire is a great creative force if it is pure intense and sustained it is our desires that keep stirring us up to action and they will strengthen and broaden you if you make them materialize every man who achieves success deserves it when he first started out he did not understand how to solve the problems that afterwards presented themselves but he did each thing as it came up in the very best way that he could and this developed his power of doing bigger things we become masters of business by learning to do well whatever we attempt the man that has thorough knowledge of his business can of course direct it much more easily and skillfully than the man who lacks that knowledge the skilled business director can sit in his private office and still know accurately what is actually being done he knows what should be done in any given time and if it is not accomplished he knows that his employees are not turning out the work that they should 
it is then easy to apply the remedy. Business success depends on well-concentrated efforts. You must use every mental force you can muster. The more these are used, the more they increase. Therefore, the more you accomplish today, the more force you will have at your disposal with which to solve your problems tomorrow. If you are working for someone else today and wish to start in a business for yourself, think over carefully what you would like to do. Then when you have resolved what you want to do, you will be drawn towards it. There is a law that opens the way to the fulfillment of your desires. Of course, back of your desires, you must put forward the necessary effort to carry out your purpose. You must use your power to put your desires into force. Once they are created and you keep up your determination to have them fulfilled, you both consciously and unconsciously work toward their materialization. Set your heart on your purpose. Concentrate your thought upon it. Direct your efforts with all your intelligence, and in due time you will realize your ambition. Feel yourself a success. Believe you are a success, and thus put yourself in the attitude that demands recognition, and the thought current draws to you what you need to make you a success. Don't be afraid of big undertakings. Go at them with grit, and pursue methods that you think will accomplish your purpose. You may not at first meet with entire success, but aim so high that if you fall a little short, you will still have accomplished much. What others have done, you can do. You may even do what others have been unable to do. Always keep a strong desire to succeed in your mind. Be in love with your aim and work, and make them, as far as possible, square with the rule of the greatest good to the greatest number, and your life cannot be a failure. The successful business attitude must be cultivated to make the most out of your life, the attitude of expecting great things from both yourself and others. It alone will often cause men to make good, to measure up to the best that is in them. It is not the spasmodic spurts that count on a long journey, but the steady efforts. Spurts fatigue and make it hard for you to continue. Rely on your own opinion. It should be as good as anyone else's. When once you reach a conclusion, abide by it. Let there be no doubt or wavering in your judgment. If you are uncertain about every decision you make, you will be subject to harassing doubts and fears which will render your judgment of little value. The man that decides according to what he thinks right and who learns from every mistake acquires a well-balanced mind that gets the best results. He gains the confidence of others. He is known as the man that knows what he wants and not as the one that is as changeable as the weather. The man of today wants to do business with the man that he can depend upon. Uncertainties in the business world are meeting with more disfavor. Reliable firms want to do business with men of known qualities, with men of firmness, judgment, and reliability. So if you wish to start in business for yourself, your greatest asset, with the single exception of a sound physique, is that of a good reputation. A successful business is not hard to build if we can concentrate all our mental forces upon it. It is the man that is unsettled because he does not know what he wants that goes to the wall. We hear persons say that business is trying on the nerves, but it is the unsettling elements of fret and worry and suspense that are nerve-exhausting and not the business. Executing one's plans may cause fatigue. Enjoyment comes with rest. If there has not been any unnatural strain, the recuperative powers replace what energy has been lost. By attending to each day's work properly, you develop the capacity to do a greater work tomorrow. It is this gradual development that makes possible the carrying out of big plans. The man that figures out doing something each hour of the day gets somewhere. At the end of each day you should be a step nearer your aim. Keep the idea in mind that you mean to go forward, that each day must mark an advance, and forward you will go. You do not even have to know the exact direction, so long as you are determined to find the way, but you must not turn back once you have started. Even the brilliant men's conceptions of the possibilities of their mental forces are so limited and below their real worth that they are far more likely to belittle their possibilities than they are to exaggerate them. 
You don't want to think that an aim is impossible because it has never been realized in the past. Every day someone is doing something that was never done before. We are pushing ahead faster. Formerly it took decades to build up a big business, but today it is only but a matter of years, sometimes of months. Plan each day's activities carefully, and you can reach any height you aim at. If each thing you do is done with concise and concentrated thought, you will be able to turn out an excellent quality and a large quantity of work. Plan to do so much work during the day, and you will be astonished to see how much more you will do than on other days when you had not decided on any certain amount. I have demonstrated that the average business working force could do the same amount of work in six hours that they now do in eight, without using up any more energy. Never start to accomplish anything in an indecisive, indefinite, uncertain way. Tackle everything with a positiveness and an earnestness that will concentrate your mind and attract the very best associated thoughts. You will in a short time find that you will have extra time for planning bigger things. The natural leader always draws to himself, by the law of mental attraction, ideas in his chosen subject that have never been conceived by others. This is of the greatest importance and help. If you are properly trained, you benefit much by others' thoughts, and providing you generate from within yourself something of value, they will benefit from yours. We are heirs of all the ages, but we must know how to use our inheritance. The confident, pushing, hopeful, determined man influences all with whom he associates and inspires the same qualities in them. You feel that his is a safe example to follow, and he rouses the same force within you that is pushing him onward and upward. One seldom makes a success of anything that he goes at in a listless, spiritless way. To build up a business, you must see it expanding in your mind before it actually takes tangible shape. Every great task that has ever been accomplished has first been merely a vision in the mind of its creator. Detail after detail has had to be worked out in his mind from his first faint idea of the enterprise. Finally, a clear idea was formed, and then the accomplishment, which was only the material result of the mental concept, followed. The up-to-date businessman is not content to build only for the present, but is planning ahead. If he does not, he will fall behind his competitor who is. What we are actually doing today was carefully thought out and planned by others in the past. All progressive businesses are conducted this way. That is why the young businessman of today is likely to accomplish more in a few years than his father did in all his life. There is no reason why your work or business should fag you out. When it does, there is something wrong. You are attracting forces and influence that you should not, because you are not in harmony with what you are doing. There is nothing so tiring as to try to do the work for which we are unfitted, both by temperament and training. Each one should be engaged in a business that he loves. He should be furthering movements with which he is in sympathy. He will then only do his best work and take intense pleasure in his business. In this way, while constantly growing and developing his powers, he is at the same time rendering through his work genuine and devoted service to humanity. Business success is not the result of chance, but of scientific ideas and plans carried out by an aggressive and progressive management. Use your mental forces so that they will grow and develop, Remember that everything you do is the result of mental action. Therefore, you can completely control your every action. Nothing is impossible for you. Don't be afraid to tackle a difficult proposition. Your success will depend upon the use you make of your mind. This is capable of wonderful development. See that you make full use of it, and not only develop yourself but your associates. Try to broaden the visions of those with whom you come in contact and you will broaden your own outlook of life. Are you afraid of responsibilities? In order for the individual soul to develop, you must have responsibilities. You must manifest the omnipotence of the law of supply. The whole world is your legitimate sphere of activity. How much of a conqueror are you? What have you done? Are you afraid of responsibility? Or are you ever dodging, flinching, or sidestepping it? If you are, 
you are not a real man. Your higher self never winces. So be a man and allow the powers of the higher self to manifest, and you will find you have plenty of strength, and you will feel better when you are tackling difficult propositions. End of Lesson 10